All right, we got a few people still joining us, but I don't see any more reason to wait. So I want to thank everybody for joining us on today's third Thursday. Uh, the topic is equity and cultural competency. Um, I'll uh, introduce our presenter shortly. Um, just a couple of announcements. Our next third Thursday is going to be on September 19th. It's also going to be a really interesting topic. I'll be The title is Towards Coastal Adaptation, Evaluating Plans Across U.S. Island Jurisdictions. Um, I'll post the link in the chat later. Um, also, if anyone's interested, we did have um, our newsletter was released today. I also put some information in the chat. A lot of what I'm saying is going to be in the chat, but um, just want to give you a heads up. Uh, as we go into the presentation, if you do have any questions, um, pop up in the chat and then we'll be navigating them um, throughout and then we'll have a question and answer time at the end. Okay, so looks like, looks like we got some, some going on here. So, all right, without delaying any further, our presenter today is Suzanne Fru. She's a NDPTC instructor, subject matter expert, and the owner of the Fru Group. Uh, she's been with NDPTC for over 12 years, mm -hmm. and she was also a former resident of Maui. Uh, we've been honored to have her. She's taught over 70 trainings um, spanning four or five different classes she's certified uh, for today. So we're really happy to have her. And um, I'm really excited for this topic. But yeah, Suzanne, um, if you're good to go, I um, it's all up you now. Thank you, Mel. Much appreciated. Aloha, everyone. Hello. Um, great. I'm so glad everybody could uh, join us here today. Um, this is one of my favorite topics and I have a lot of passion and been working in it for quite a while and um, I want to echo what Mel said is that we have the meeting chat that's open and at any point if somebody would like to add something um, uh, I do a lot of um, uh, a lot of training for NDPTC and I'm very I'm always encouraging people to be interactive and put something in the meeting chat at the end we'll have some time where we can discuss some things but um, please feel free to to add your thoughts. So today we're going to take the next few minutes and we're going to look at the whole role of equity and cultural competency in emergency management, in community building, in resilience building, um, especially at this point in time where we're really shifting uh, because of climate change. And uh, we have a lot of communities that are being very heavily impacted. I currently live in the San Francisco Bay Area, so I am in the state of California, and that is certainly something that we see all the time here. So let's see. Okay. All right, here we go. I'm controlling NDPTC screen, so. <laughs> okay, so let's start off by just talking, sort of laying the foundation for what we're talking about today. And um, as we all know, uh, there is just huge um, shifting sh situations going. The, the, the social situation is changing. The environmental situation is changing. It's far more complex now. Um, the risks are shifting. Uh, we've got a lot of um, um, interface where people are living in the woods. They're living next to the seashore. They're living in a lot of places that are becoming more at risk due to climate change issues for uh, all kinds of um, for all kinds of things that are happening both in urban areas and like heat islands on the coast such as uh, sea level rise, um, ocean temperature rise. We have so many different things that are impacting that landscape and that's all the people we serve. So but in the middle of this we also have other situations happening where we got as you can see with this photograph, we've got a lot of demographic shifts. We've got a lot of cultural shifts. So as emergency managers or people who are working with the community, we need to be able to figure out how to address that changing landscape of the people we serve and also in the context of the environment that we serve. So if we just think about it, we're always in a state of change. That's nothing new, but 
the circumstances are shifting and what we have to do is pivot a lot faster. And we have to think about how we can serve our people even better. Their livelihoods are different, their generational shifts are changing. Um, and so that is the context within which I'm uh, presenting this today. So if you walk away with one thought from today, I want you to remember this quote, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. And that is critically important to take away because so often we look at it through our own bubble. We, there's um, a statement that a friend of mine who I teach with a lot, she says, look at the 10 people around you. Think about the 10 people you spend the most time with. And that is a reflection of your world for the most part. So again, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. So if you can walk away with that, that will inform a lot of you, where you go in the future. So this next slide is a um, graphic, it's a cartoon that I found many years ago, contacted the owner and said, may I use this in my talks? And he said, yes. So this one sums up what we just saw. So if you take a look at that, that is really what we're dealing with when we go out working in our communities. As you can see, it's a woman in a bathing suit. Um, and she's saying everything covered but her eyes. What a cruel dominated culture. The, the other woman saying nothing covered but her eyes. What a cruel dominated culture. Again, the way we come to our work is through our culture that we had come out of. And so if we think about that, again, we see the things as we are. So again, as we go into our work, we need to think about that. So I use the word cultural competency. So what does that really mean? Well, there's a lot of definitions out there. There's tremendous research that's all around the world, some great stuff that's being done in Australia and New Zealand and, and here in the United States and in Europe everywhere on what cultural competence is. And there's a lot of different um, definitions for it. But I'm sharing this one because this was one that was actually put in legislation in the state of California in 2019. So if we think of it, it's the ability to understand, value, communicate with, and interact with people all across the different cultures. This, why is this important? Because we've got a lot of people who are from diverse populations who are now very, um, very much more at risk because of economics, uh, because of social status, because of traditionally held belief systems. Um, we have a whole uh, entire world out there that is shifting now and we need to be able to respond to them. So in our work, the role of cultural competency and delivering equity to everyone is critically important because those are the people who are becoming most at risk when we have major heat days and we have heat islands where we've got large pockets where people live and they have no air conditioning, they have no money, they have health risks. Those are the reasons why we need to start giving priority in our work to those people who can succumb the most through disease, or through their own physical situation, their own social, emotional situation. Those are the pieces that we need to really attend to when we're doing our work in disaster. So when we think about it, we think about, you know, what is this? So oftentimes you hear of equality, uh, and that has been a term that's been used consistently throughout this country for many, many years. Now, in one of our courses, we have a different graphic. I tend to use this one because I think it's quite interesting because of the third piece here. But again, in that first image, um, we see that treating people equally, it doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. It's not what's needed. Um, you can see the first one, everybody's being given the same thing. They can't see the game. The second one, they're addressing it in different ways that address what they specifically need. So when we think about our communities in emergency management, that's what we need to think about. So that area in that second deck, that second slide in the deck, that is a really important piece. We need to understand our communities. We need to understand them culturally. We need to understand what they need from us. 
The third image is quite interesting because in the third image, they remove the barriers, all right? So they removed, they removed these systemic barriers, whether it's marginalized racism, whatever it is, but they've taken it out so they can all see the game. And then there's not this need for accommodations. That's our target. That's where we'd like to get. It's not a reality for the most part in our in the in the culture within the United States and around the world. That is our target. That's our eyes on the prize. When we start writing our plans, when we start doing our work, when we're responding to a disaster, what we do in that second image can make the difference between life and death for many people. And we'll talk about that. So let's go back a little bit and just take a look at what are some of the things that have sort of led us to this point today? So let's look at some of the, the legal issues. Let's look at some of the policies. And I call it our painful journey because we have not learned. We have not thought about that whole issue of equity over the years. And now we're certainly paying the price. Many people have, but um, in a lot of our work that has been done historically with emergency management, I've been professionally in the emergency management world for over 30 years, um, which is great since I'm 22. No, <laughs> but that's something that's really, um, I've seen that trajectory over a long period of time. And I really call it our painful journey. But if we take a look at this, let's look at some of the things that have happened that has led us to this point. So like I said, I live in the state of California. Now, what you see on the left-hand side was an audit. It was a state audit that was done uh, about five years ago. And it was after some horrific fires that we had. For those who are familiar with Paradise, uh, the campfire that burned where we had over 80 individuals who were mostly elderly. They, um, they had disabilities. Many were in, uh, confined to wheelchairs. Uh, they were not able to get out. And, and we had over about 85 that died. So we started looking at who are these most vulnerable residents? Who are the people who are not getting served? So we began to see this really strong relationship between particularly in the state of California, the fires, the wildfires, they were burning more intensely. They were burning down to the mineral earth. Then of course we now have Maui, what has happened on Maui with the fires in Lahaina uh, and in up country. So what we're starting to see is we're starting to see that this trajectory where these, um, where these climate impacts are really impacting the people who are least, um, least able or who are more traditionally vulnerable. They're from diverse populations or they're from populations that have traditionally not been served in the same way, um, in a way that would be equitable um, as the others. So we have our individuals who are very young, who are very old, people who have disabilities, that could be um, mental health disabilities, it could, be, um, it could be emotional disabilities, it could be physical disabilities. Uh, we have traditional gaps with, uh, with gender, uh, with sexual preference, with sexual orientation. Uh, the whole LGBTQ community uh, has been traditionally um, not served in a way that has been equitable in a lot of the shelter sites. And so that, so, and also individuals who perhaps don't speak English, who don't speak the native tongue, the native language. So those are the kinds of um, focuses that we now have that we're really trying to look at. This particular woman here, um, she was uh, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson. She gave a talk um, in uh, the, at the Natural Hazards Workshop in Colorado. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, the Natural Hazards Center at uh, the University of Colorado Boulder, absolutely terrific and a fantastic resource. She uh, spoke about this. She drove through, she was a main driver between uh, a couple different bills that went through. And that started a lot of the trajectory for legislative change in the state of California. And I really like to give a shout out to her because of her brilliance and her leadership. And we are definitely looking for leadership. The audit came out now in the state of California. 
There are frameworks in place that for um, equity on uh, for individuals with disabilities and also cultural competency. So we literally in the state of California, you now have a framework that you can use to guide your writing of your plans and they will review that. And so the State um, Office of Emergency Services is a fantastic resource um, with uh, headed up by Vance Taylor. Um, I could not recommend that more. So how did we get there even before this happened in the late um, uh, 2017, uh, the Tubbs fire, the glass fire complex, the fires that we had, Paradise Fire? Well, let's go back. So when you start going back, this started really happening in, in uh, New York City. Uh, there were lawsuits in New York City, and this was uh, before, it was a year before Sandy. Um, and uh, there was a class of 900,000 New Yorkers. They had disabilities. Um, that was vision, mobility, uh, mental disabilities. The class, uh, the, the court case went to trial in 2013. Um, and they had evidence at the, at the in the court case uh, that said there was no system to evacuate. A lot of these people were trapped in high rise buildings. Um, people who were in wheelchairs, uh, they didn't know which they did not know which um, shelter was a uh, wheelchair accessible. So they have uh, that was an issue. Then they had no protocols. They didn't have any protocols for address the needs of people with disabilities um, in power outages and especially on issues with communication systems. So this is a very important issue. And then public transportation, people couldn't get there. So when we start looking at transportation and evacuation, this was huge. So let's go back beyond what's happened in California to the other side of the country. And you'll see that there was a lot of work being done there and um, there was uh, there was very specific ADA planning failures that were cited. And as a result, there have been a big focus now. There's been a real big focus on communications, particularly when we are doing our planning, our emergency operation plans, particularly when we start looking at community planning, when we look at urban planning, when we start really laying out cities, when we start thinking about how these systemic approaches are, particularly in the areas of communications, sheltering, and evacuation and transportation. Those three specific areas are areas that are at a top, uh, a top priority. I also have one more in here that I want to bring up a little bit later. But they, these lawsuits, definitely there was a lawsuit in the city of Los Angeles. And um, that was, again, you know, there was a lot of things, there were settlements that were reached and there's been a tremendous amount of work done in the Los Angeles community. I do a huge shout out to my colleagues down there. So there's a lot of focus now on, um, on ADA planning. So we have the cultural differences, we have uh, disabilities, uh, those are the areas that what I am really addressing today. So what is the problem? So we start looking at it and going, well, this is, so the issue is how do we operationalize it? A lot of people talk about this and I've heard it talked about for years, but when it comes down to, you know, where the, the rubber meets the road, where the, you know, boots on the ground, how do you operationalize it? There's lots of concepts out there. There's lots of academic theories. There's a lot of study. There is a lot of everybody knows, wow, we've got to do this. It's like, how do we do it? And the point is, we need to do it to serve the whole community. And that is an extremely important piece that you see now in FEMA, in the FEMA strategic planning efforts, um, Liz and other folks have put in very good information. Jeff, thank you. Liz, thank you. Everybody, make sure you take a look at the chat. But that's the what that's where we are right now. It's like, how do we operationalize this? And that's a bit what I want to talk about today. So now what I want to do is go through some of those pieces that I talked about, some of those areas 
um, that were really that are very tricky and that we know that we need to address with through with communications, um, you know, in the planning and sheltering, um, evacuation and, and transportation as an example. So planning opportunities. So there's lots of planning opportunities out there all across the board. Um, this was another issue that I wanted to bring out here. It's not only uh, a natural hazard, there can be issues with uh, power shutdowns. For example, PSPSs, public safety power shutoffs. We had one here in the Bay Area. We had um, individuals who fell downstairs uh, because they there was no planning process for them. So this was an example of a local news story here where a woman was hurt going down a stairwell, she stumbled over another woman who had fallen in the stairwell. So when we start looking at what these issues are in the planning process, what do we do? How can we do that? Well, we can look at the emergency planning, the plans themselves, and we can look at the processes of how do we include people from all these populations? How do we bring them in? How do we involve them? And then when we start doing our plans, we write out how we involve them. So um, for example, bringing in individuals uh, who are from the community themselves, let's say they're unhoused, they're homeless, bringing them into the planning process is extremely important. If you can't get them into the process, you bring in the social service agencies or the organizations that represent them, the different social service agencies, the homeless shelters, the food banks, the nonprofit organizations, and the transportation providers. They're another really, really good um, uh, wealth of knowledge out there. So knowing who you can go to, to find out how to involve them in the planning process. So identifying them, um, even putting together um, uh, an access and functional needs um, uh, committee and bringing people onto that committee and getting them regularly involved with the planning process. It's an extremely um, proactive way to operationalize getting them into, into the, the planning process. So now I wanna give you a few um, examples of where um, I've been involved with this. So one example is on, on Maui. On, first off, I wanna talk about the county of Maui. And um, back in 2015, I was involved with the, the planning department um, there. And we had federal funding and we worked on post-disaster reconstruction guidelines and protocols. And those protocols were, um, we gathered and we built those protocols based on community workshops. And in those community workshops, we went to the different uh, areas of the Maui, the island of Maui, but also Molokai. Um, and we, we gathered feedback and the way we did it was through engagement. Uh, we built a game and we played games and this is a very, very important tool for doing your community engagement work. You can see on the slide, you can see where we were all playing a game. The, the bottom left hand on Hana was a local senator. He got involved. They, everybody really enjoyed it. We did it in Lahaina. We did it in Kihei. We did it in Paia, Molokai. We did it all over the place. And then we pulled together. And from that, from those workshops, we built the policy statements that went out. And we also built language, uh, we built uh, communication messages, but that uh, that the guidelines and protocols that we built then were utilized on other islands. But that is a really important way that you can go and get involved in your community um, and go out to where they are, involve them. We involve them through food, we involve them through honoring the elderly, um, we uh, gave um, the kapuna, the older individuals there, lays, put lays around their neck. 
Uh, and we always talk story. We had people share that was extremely important in what we were doing. And so that was a very successful initiative that we did there with the planning department um, for the planning department there. So if you fast forward, um, now we've got Maui that has, of course, they're in the recovery process for the horrific uh, wildfire that they just had where over 100 people died. Many, many, many um, homes were lost, businesses were lost, um, a lot of lives were lost. And so I've been working uh, on that recovery process. And I want to showcase one initiative that we've uh, been working on that's in the process of wrapping up in the next few weeks. But the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation um, <clears throat> developed a business coaching program. And one of my colleagues, John Shear, uh, who has Ready Zone, um, that he and I were teaching the um, business disaster recovery um, effort in the coaching program. And one of the things that we did in this coaching program when we were physically, we did it online and then we were in person, is we had one place where we said, show aloha. And it was very important to, to show respect, to give each other time to share, to respect their challenges because everyone is different and everybody's plans are going to be different. And, and the main thing we focused on was to also say, everybody... This isn't an end all be all. It's going to change. It's going to pivot. Let's keep remembering that piece. It's a work in progress. And if we have that mindset as we walk forward, that's the showing aloha with the people who we work with. We talked about cultural competency with our employees, with those that we serve. These were the business communities, our vendors, um, and our customer base. How do we pivot? Those are the things that we were really focusing on. So that was a way that we were able to address it in this particular coaching program. So let's talk about hazard mitigation planning. I want to talk about another project and a really unique way that we address this in um, uh, working with a hazard mitigation plan for the, uh, the state system. It's a very large state system. There's over 24 campuses, a chancellor's office, California State University. It's the biggest one in the country. And we, I was on a team and we were working on their, um, through HMGP funding, we were working on their hazard mitigation plans. And we did the hazard vulnerability risk assessment. Well, I asked and said, I would like to do one that focuses specifically on their social vulnerabilities, not just on uh, having the social vulnerability in the background, but does an assessment of their social vulnerability. So for this one, what we did was we decided to have three initial questions and then we uh, gave those questions and then we um, gave a synopsis of the campus's response and we began to capture it that way. The other piece we did was that we used icons and I am a huge advocate for the use of icons to get out of just language when we're working with individuals. So again, if you take a look here, we took a look at the, the populations at risk, uh, the, those most difficult to reach, and then um, those who had limited support. And so we began, we developed a group of icons that we use for all of the system throughout the campuses, and we use those icons. Then the other piece that was very unique for this, and um, I got mentored by individuals across the country um, who were um, sociologists and were working with um, uh, looking at um, social vulnerabilities and put together um, a risk index looking at 11 issues. So everything from housing insecurity and food insecurity, racial equity, digital equity, all the way over to LGBTQI and transportation dependency, which is a huge piece. And we did an assessment. Now think of this, this is not an assessment of the individuals on the campus. We looked at staff, we looked at um, um, staff, instructors, you know, the administration, we looked at the student population, at the faculty. But what we were looking at was how, from an emergency management perspective, 
where were they at? Was were they were they was it an issue of concern or was it not an issue of concern? And did they have it? Did they have it plans? Was it being addressed in their plans? And I just want to say, look at the number of reds that went across there. This was a new concept for a lot of them and where they were saying, no, it's not in their planning process right now. So I, I come back out and I say, just take a look at yourself, look at some of your own organizations and where you're working. Could this be something that you could use in your own processes, what you're doing when you're doing your vulnerability assessments? So next I wanna go into um, communications. Whoops, into communications. And communications, this is a photograph that I took off of the, um, uh, the peace wall in um, Northern Ireland a couple of years ago. And I thought it's so appropriate, language rights or human rights. And my background is I was a public information officer for uh, FEMA region nine full time. And I, I worked a lot of disasters in the context of communications. But language rights are truly human rights. If you can't, if I, if I can't get the message, if I can't understand the message, if I can't personalize it, and I can't have an opportunity to vet it with people around me, I'm not going to take action. And the goal is we want them to take action. So I want to bring up um, a situation that happened that really struck me um, um, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2019, and this was a situation where um, a local judge, a uh, county judge, Hildaga, actually um, spoke Spanish and, and was reprimanded by the local officials. And this was, this was, you know, speak English. Um, this is America, speak English. This is, you know, clearly this is not okay. So again, when we start thinking about how do we take these kind of situations and apply them to ourselves, think about this in emergency alerts and warning systems. Um, what's the accessibility of your emergency warning and alerts um, and notification systems in your jurisdictions? Um, do you use um, American Sign Language? Do you use closed captioning? Do you use alternative text? What are your tools that you're using to reach out to your community that might not be able to hear um, an alert, that might not be able to see it. Um, if you have a voice line that is that you're using, um, do they have? Um, do there is there language services? Is there relay services? Or what kinds of systems and technologies are you using? Um, it would be in the alerts and warning systems. It would be in your press conferences. If you have a press conference. Is the interpreter in view? Really important. Um, those are the kinds of things that we really need to do. Then if you've got translation services there, have copies of those agreements. Because as we know, when an event happens, the person who is usually in charge is off for some reason. It, it happens all the time. Making sure you have codified all of those agreements and making them accessible. Those are ways that you can really do that. And then even going over into social media, um, how are you putting it out? Are you putting things out in only in English only? Are you putting it out? Um, are you adding descriptors that people understand? Um, are you, are you, is it always in English or is it always in Spanish or whatever your, your language, your, 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 your threshold languages are in your community? So these are the questions that we ask ourselves. So I wanted to give an example of, um, of a couple of uh, projects that I worked on. One was in the San Francisco Bay Area when we were doing communication uh, toolkits. Uh, one of the things that I did in support of the project was I put together uh, a translation policy um, and development guidance for anyone who was looking to reach out to diverse populations, populations at risk, who did not speak the language or who had limited capacities and gave guidelines for how do, as an organization, as an agency, how they are doing their translations, defining things, making it easy. Um, I went out and interviewed um, public information officers from 12 um, counties and, and 
And that gave me information then to put together the guideline. Down in the county of Santa Barbara, and I'm going to be down there uh, next month uh, teaching for NDPTC down there um, with my colleague Steve Wood. We're going to be in county of Santa Barbara, and one of the projects I worked on was their shelter plan and also um, a messaging guide. And that was a really interesting project, and, and there was a lot of work done there of how do we support that. And one of the ways we supported it, again, I'm going back to this is uh, we used icons. So if you have a shelter environment, if you have a shelter environment, not everybody speaks English. In that area, there's a lot of agricultural uh, communities. There's a lot of people who speaks very limited English. Um, and we used, um, they were absolutely terrific to work with. Uh, we developed, um, uh, for example, different, you know, transgender, um, looking at uh, medical devices. Um, um, we looked at forced recruitment since it was a very big ag community. Looking at ways that you can use icons there locally in a shelter or in um, any kind of transfer point, how can you use alternative ways to help people understand what it is that you're trying to, to describe? So that is a really important, um, and it's one that I'm particularly interested in. Now, when we go over to sheltering, when we actually go into the sheltering, there's a lot of issues with sheltering um, that it's one of the most important places where you can address the equity, where you can address the cultural competency. So um, in, involving individuals who represent uh, the populations with disabilities, access and functional needs is a very important one. Um, looking at your shelter sites, uh, pre-identifying those shelter sites and inspecting those shelter sites to make sure they're in compliance. For ADA compliance, really important because there's so many shelter sites across the country um, that are not giving regular, they're not um, they're not, uh, you know, being checked on for compliance. This is really, really important. Um, and just looking at, you know, what are those resources there? So there's a lot of things with sheltering. And I actually uh, put together a, a hit list because I really, I really wanted to address this one in particular. Um, so in our shelter sites, taking a look at this. So these are ways that you can address equity really building equity, and that is um, those wraparound services, um, making sure they comply with ADA. Are the, are the resources available? Are the resources to get them transitioning out? Um, I worked on a lot of shelter annexes um, in different counties, and one of the things is in the Santa Barbara shelter annex, um, created a list of questions that they could just ask throughout the emergency operation plan, throughout the, the, the shelter annex. This is really important. You can do that in whatever, whether you're working with a, a university, whether you're working with a company, um, whether you're working with, um, uh, with a, a, a federal agency, a state agency, a local agency. These are the kinds of things that you can include in your annexes. Um, I included some of these in, uh, I was working with um, a big county in Virginia for their um, their business community and helping uh, give um, guidance for working with uh, their business, the small businesses, which are huge outside of the DC area. And we built in a lot of these pieces because they have huge diverse populations there. And so we really want to um, address the needs of your specific population group uh, that you are serving. So the next area is the evacuation and transportation. So in evacuation and transportation, again, sadly, in Paradise, um, they couldn't evacuate. They were elderly, they were disabled, there was issues for, you know, for getting out um, on Maui. We know in Lahaina, 
uh, the issues of getting out of Lahaina in an extremely fast moving wildfire um, that um, took a lot of people's lives and people um, you know, went into the water, they, they tried to get out, there was down power lines, there was all kinds of reasons why they could not get out. So these are, these are some of these issues. So um, Matt, that's a great question. Uh, will the slides be made available? And Mel would be able to answer that question for you. Um, and I'm, I imagine they certainly would be. Um, so thank you for joining us, Matt. Appreciate it. Um, so in this emergency evacuation, ensuring the language is understandable. Um, it's a very difficult thing. I listened to the 911 tapes from the Tubbs fire that happened in Sonoma County, and it was heartbreaking. People could not understand the language. They couldn't understand the 911 dispatch. It was very, it was tragic. And again, we had a lot of, um, we had deaths there as well. So again, involving the representatives from that local community, from those diverse populations in your development of your emergency operation plan, getting written agreements with your transportation providers uh, to support those with disabilities, to support translation for people who are trying to get out and making copies of those agreements available really critical. Make sure they're codified, that you can grab it, you can say, this is what we do. And then making sure that that process that the individuals needing to follow during that evacuation can be, um, make sure that they get that instruction. Just because you have it as an emergency manager doesn't mean they know how to follow the process. That is the preparedness part. That's what we can do, you know, beforehand. And, and that's, you know, to our home, to our school, to our work. These are all real critical areas. So um, in Sacramento County, I worked on a couple pieces where we were working on the evacuation plan and then also did pre-scripted evacuation messages. We went a step further and did um, messages that we could grab and go uh, with what they had there. But in your evacuation plan, I really encourage you to think of all of these, these issues that a lot of people don't think of. What do you do, for example, if you have, you are providing um, support to get out? If you're trying to get out, uh, what do you do if you have a registered sex offenders? How do you evacuate? How do you evacuate the individuals? How do you evacuate if you have prison populations, which is covered, but making sure you are all on the same page with your population group. You have a large unhoused population, a large homeless population. You've got, uh, you've got homes that are set up for individuals with disabilities. Uh, uh, you've got assisted living, all of those things for your particular jurisdiction make sure you're considering those issues of concern. Really, really critical. So the last area that I really wanted to address is mass fatality. So this is something that we have talked, um, I have talked about, I have, a, I, I have a website and on my website, I have a blog post, a, a, a blog, a video blog, um, that I shot right after the Turkish um, earthquake. And on mass fatality, um, this is an area where culture really does count. So when Arden was uh, the prime minister uh, in New Zealand, they had the horrific mosque attack. Um, these students in the upper left-hand side, um, they did a haka. And a haka is... It's very traditional. It's done before rugby games. It's done when there's an outcry, there's a support. Uh, when I was a competitive outrigger paddler on Maui, we would do, people did hakas before we would go into competition. So that is a traditional belief structure there. So again, honoring the way they did that. Now Jarden, uh, or what Arden did was she went in and she uh, she covered her head. She was respectful, and she was really commended for that. So she's one of my heroes as well. 
So in a mass fatality incident, I'm going to invite you to consider three things. One, this is where culture really makes a difference. So having site access. So if it is a crime scene, if there's a, if there's an explosion, if there you're going to have a secured perimeter, and you're going to have um, police protocols, you're going to have very strong security protocols. Just know you need to prepare your security officials that a lot of cultures really want access to fulfill spiritual traditions, um, cultural traditions and spiritual traditions, both on site. Um, and I was first aware of that when there was a, a airplane crash in the South Pacific at one point and there was restricted access and people wanted to go and pray on site where their loved one was lost. So that's the first thing is site access. Second one is just the religious beliefs. Um, they might be horrifically offended if they are photographing the site, if they're using photography with body identification, the body recovery process, which in this our communities, it has to take place. But be prepared to communicate what the recovery process is going to be. Be open, be honest, um, but be proactive in getting that information out there to manage those expectations. And then the third thing is legal status. So there are individuals who, for example, might be in a temporary morgue um, and their loved ones, you know, have perished. Um, they want to uh, make information inquiries. They want to access records. Uh, they might be in the LGBTQI community and they're not very, they are not uh, legalized as the, the spouse of the person who has passed away. Think about how you and your team can be prepared to support the protocols that are in place and have communication in place, uh, whether it's a family assistance center uh, or a temporary morgue. Again, those are the different areas that you might be called into play. And I will just say that my bottom line is culture matters. Remember at the beginning, I showed that slide uh, with the bathing suit. That is a really big, important piece. Culture really, really does matter. It doesn't have to do just with religion. It has to do with perceptions. It has to do with cultures, whether it's a high touch society, like a Japanese society where people are very tight and they talk to each other, then their decision-making process is quite different. And that could be in an evacuation process, whether they talk to somebody, whether they talk to grandma, whether they talk to the head of the household or um, a low touch society, whether it would be a, a Swiss society or a German society. They don't have those same protocols. It's Their culture is not like that. So these are where the culture really does come in. So the last thing I want to do is I want to just quickly highlight some resources for you because there's tremendously good resources that are out there. So, and they are the key. Um, there's lots out there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's tremendous uh, resources that are there for you already. So um, the first thing is guides. And if I can get my, there we go. Probably going to jump twice. No. Okay. Um, so the first thing is there are guidebooks. So this is on the left. You'll see one from the feds. Um, that is from FEMA. FEMA put out just, it just was um, within the last year, Achieving Equitable Recovery. It's an excellent guidebook. Um, really, really solid. They've, it's, it's very in-depth. It's got good guidance. It's got, it's got fantastic resources in there. If you don't have it, grab it get it. It is really, you can go online, you can get it, you can download it. Um, please, I really encourage you to do that. Um, the other one in the back is of, uh, in the health line, you can go online. So, you know, Office of Human, you know, resources. I mean, there's so many, American Planning Association, all kinds of organizations have sheets like this. So um, this is for in your healthcare community, they have examples of how do you work culturally appropriate. And then uh, disaster justice, that is done um, by an individual in the nonprofit community. Again, it's not just government. 
we really want to reach out to our community partners because that is that is your first those are truly your first responders in so many ways those people are out there those people who know the community so those are guides that are in place that you can access and use so the next one are workshops and trainings there's lots that are out there a lot of times people just don't know where to get them so on the top left, that's from the state of California, California Office of Emergency Services. They have a free um, uh, course that you can go to, and that is on um, setting up shelter sites. There's really, it's fantastic. So it's how do you integrate um, access and functional needs into emergency management? And they just recently updated it. So terrific um, opportunity there. In the middle, big and prominent, is, of course, ours from NDPTC. We just finished revising that. Um, I'm very excited because in a week, I'm going to be going up to Northern California, going to be teaching our first our first rollout. of. I was one of the instructors who uh, redeveloped this course, and we very much changed it over to look at um, e um, equity issues and cultural competency. So uh, FEMA was very gracious. They supported us in putting a lot of changes on that. Um, at the top right is something that I've done. Uh, uh, the County of Sonoma came to me and said, please put something together and went out to three different, um, had workshops, held workshops, on the ground workshops to work with that particular county on their uh, culturally diverse populations within uh, within their county. So there's a lot of people out there such as myself who do these kinds of things. So don't, you know, look around for what some options are there. And then again, um, Converge. So if you go again to uh, Colorado and see what they've done in Colorado, uh, there are some fantastic resources there and on the Natural Hazard Center website, they do have opportunities that you can go and get trainings, you can go get funding, you can go get um, jobs, you can go get um, uh, resources. So those are really great. Um, those are really good opportunities. And Amy has put in there into the chat um, what the list of courses are for NDPTC. And we've just revised also to our, 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 um, our climate adaptation for emergency manage class, management class. Um, very excited, gonna be teaching that for the first time um, in a, a couple weeks or less than a couple weeks. And so these two classes we've just rolled out and then we're gonna go to Southern California and teach them down there. So again, a lot of resources that are out there. Um, I spoke about OES and the, um, and Vance Taylor's um, shop there. Uh, please, he's got some great, they, it's an entire team. It's not one individual. I definitely want to say that. He's an amazing leader, uh, but there's a whole uh, slew of individuals who have worked and done some great work there. So that's what you can do. And what I'd like to do is leave you with this thought, which is you're not going to fix everything. Don't try to fix everything, but take up the fight. It's not, it's, we need to, we need to address this fight. We need to be in there. We need to make progress. And I love this line. Your job is to fight so that somebody else can fight. And your job is to continue on. Um, fight on where you can, when you can, and however you can. So that's the, the message I really would like to leave you with. And now I want to open it up for uh, if anybody would like to share something. We've got um, just a few minutes here. Does anybody want to share something that they have done um, in their own community? Oh, thank you. I see Amy clapping. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> if anybody would like to share anything that they are doing or concerns they have about um, something or something that they would like to see furthered, you know, like this with NDPTC. I mean, you know, is there anything that other options that you would like to, to bring forward? Okay, it's quiet. We've got a lot of, um, got some good stuff in the chat. 
Um, thank you all, wow, for putting in some great stuff in the chat. Really, really appreciate that. And I am certainly open for questions. If you have any questions or want to chat with me about anything, please feel free to reach out um, and get back with me. Okay, so Jeff, uh, the former New Zealand Prime Minister's Arden. I was, I was just letting you know for- Oh, thank uh, you, appreciate that. It's a that. slide typo. Oh, thanks, appreciate that. I like that. Thanks, Jeff, appreciate that. So, yep. Jeff, you want to add anything? You, we go way back. You want to add anything? No, I posted some stuff in the chat. Uh, I'm good. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a couple minutes here. If there's anything else you'd like to uh, to add. Oh, oh, from, oh, thank you, Michaela. Thank you. Good. I'm so glad you're here, Jillian. Good to see you as well. And of course, Jeff, always great. And Carl, I see you popped in. Thanks. It's good to see you as always. Yeah, it's great to see you. And I want to thank you for a, a, a wonderful presentation, an important presentation, and also for all the uh, important good work that you're doing. And I am going to uh, encourage many of our students in our uh Graduate Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistance Program to watch this this video because I think you uh, covered a lot of um, important concepts uh, and I like uh, the examples that you gave and I think this uh, should be part of our core curriculum and so once again thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, share your ideas and and the important work that you're doing so thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, everyone. I, we're really right at the top of the hour. Thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate it, everybody. And um, we're looking forward to seeing you at an NDPTC class sometime soon. We got a lot to offer. We got some newly updated ones that we're very excited to roll out. So, and those of you who are always working on them, <laughs> thank you. You guys are the all of you are, we couldn't, the teachers couldn't, the instructors couldn't do it without you, for sure. <laughs>